What's dictating my denizens of a totalitarian regime? This is Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, uh, the podcast with the worst introductions in the podcasting game. Today, we are going to be talking about the Kims, the family that has ruled North Korea for three quarters of a century. And my guest today is Eli Olsberg, comedian, writer, and host of the podcasts Closure and Pod is a Woman. Uh, Eli, Sophie is not there to be ashamed at me for my terrible introduction this week. Would you please react with, with, with shame and horror at my, uh, my hackish ways? Ugh. Is that, is that too, uh, low-key? Oh, that ugh. was perfect. Oh, okay, that was great. perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. How's your? Uh, what do you? What do you? What do you think of the uh, the Kims, the Jong Uns, and the Jong Ills, and the Il Sungs of it all? Uh, well, you know what's funny is recently, since that climate change report came out, I've gotten so fatalistic about all of it. Uh, and for people listening, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But in case you don't, uh, there was like a few climate change reports that came out that like now have guaranteed that by 2050, civilization will be will like crumble due to climate change and so i'm like man i feel like at this point everyone's just gonna whatever we thought of them now which is not necessarily great uh the amount of you know i mean they're obviously i don't even know where to start i'm so fucking jumbled about it because i didn't know that's what we were gonna be talking about and hoo, 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 i've got thoughts um but overall i'm just like fuck we have 30 years left what the fuck i don't know whether to look at it that with more nihilism and just not acknowledge it or be more upset about it do you know what i mean well yeah i mean we're all in this situation in the modern world where there's there's so many garbage fires all around us right. that it's like is it even worth putting out the one next to me because there's this other one that's even bigger or like there's so many garbage fires that like you can't even put out just one it's just like everything around you is is burning uh yes that, that is a frustration um but at the same time, I think there's value in learning about these people, especially when they're people who um, I think have been gotten consistently wrong by sort of mainstream reporting on it. I can say pretty clearly that uh, the Kim family is one of the most requested subjects for an episode of this podcast and has been since I started doing it. And I think the reason so many people want an episode or episodes about the Kim family is because of the kind of stories that you hear about them on the news. These like crazy tales of when Kim Jong Il would be like, "Oh, I went golfing for the first time and got eleven holes in one, and then quit the sport having mastered it." And like you, you hear these wacky claims, and you assume that an episode about these guys is just going to be like one wacky fact after the other. Um, right. Yeah. And so like, yeah. And I also think that uh, you know what? It always is a thing that like kind of. <laughs> The, the, and the reason more people, I think, probably got curious, I don't think it's a coincidence that when the interview came out, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. in America were suddenly like, oh, this is someone we should be concerned with because it's uh, it's because they're in a movie. And not only that, but uh, they don't want the movie to come out. Yeah. And I think that uh, we'll be talking about the interview some in this because it's actually there's some pretty important stuff there. But I think in general, um, this is not going to be the episode that people who clicked on this excitedly hoping to hear a bunch of wacky North Korea stories are expecting because I don't think the Kim family is what most people think they are. And I, I, I think in particular, Kim Jong-un, the current ruler of North Korea, um, is a very different person than most people expect. Um, and I find that really interesting. And I think he's an important person to understand because he has a major role in our, our whole international uh clusterfuck at the moment yeah um but yeah that's what we're gonna we're gonna talk about today is uh is the history of the kim family in as much detail as i can reasonably give it now like one of the problems about covering these particular people is that a huge amount of what we read about in the news about north korea are lies uh, and they're often lies about lies uh and even like when th there's just so much misinformation that that's out there a lot of it's put out by the regime other of it's is put out by like uh sources in south korea sources in the united states but like actually parsing out what's real about the lives of any of the people in the kim dynasty is really difficult to do and uh i've done the best possible i think here uh but this is going to have I i'll say right now this will have a higher percentage of things that 10 years from now I look at and realize like, oh, that wound up not being true just because there's so much bullshit that gets put out about this family and about what goes on in North Korea. So it's this is this is a tough one. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, yeah. I because like I don't think that uh, I think anyone where there's like a dictatorship that where it's that heavy where it's like truly yeah. It, it, I mean, if you really think about it, there's not even any kind of like like here's a better example and not to uh, specifically with like if you going back to movies if you look to certain cinema you never hear anything heavy about North Korean cinema. That's how much of a vice is pressing down yeah. you know what i mean like you because even within iran during certain periods iran you know cinema there still movies managed to get out and have not only did they get out but they had a huge impact and you that has never happened to my knowledge yeah. in north korea you know the biggest the the clearest way you can sort of put like you can sort of display the differences between like iran and north korea is that i know a shitload of people who live in the united states or u.s citizens and come from an iranian background who regularly visit iran and go right. you know, back to see their family family nobody north koreans who make it out of north korea don't get to do that you don't yeah. get to go back into north korea and then go live your life in the u.s or wherever like yeah yeah, like that's a really clear, and so that's part of why up until very recently, there's been almost no good information that you could get out of uh, the country, other than what little came out from like refugees who fled. Um, you, a lot of listeners will probably remember how at the end of May 2019, repu reputable outlets around the world reported that Kim Jong-un executed several of his envoys to the United States after failing to conclude a nuclear deal with the Trump administration. Um, and then five days later, evidence arose that the people who had been executed were actually alive and there were pictures of them. So like it, it's it's so much of the time, like what we hear winds up not being true. And it's hard to say if it's like where the error came in, if it was um, North Korea putting out disinformation purposefully or the uh, some other power wanting there to be a disinformation. That's going to be like an ob a running theme in this episode. Oh, I bet. Um, and it's a running theme in... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say that I think that like yeah. uh, on top of that, there's also just the misinformation that comes out with everybody trying to break a news story. Um, I mean, that's a small percentage of it, but it's yeah. still a percentage nonetheless, you know? Yeah, numerous stories have been released about uh, Kim Jong-un, who is the current dictator. Um, there have been tales that he got so fat eating Swiss cheese that he can't see his penis, uh, <laughs> stories that he takes snake venom to help with his erections, uh, and most notoriously claims that he had his uncle executed by feeding him to starving dogs. <laughs> um, and just for an example of how misinformation percolates out, that story about him feeding his uncle to dogs came out of a Chinese satirical news website, like a Chinese equivalent of The Onion. Um, and then foreign journalists who didn't know what the Chinese site was reported it as fact. And that's not an uncommon thing. Um, wow. So, yeah, yeah. You, you get a lot of stories like that when you start digging into the old Kims. Um, and so I, I want to lead this episode off by uh, thanking a, a journalist named Anna Fifield, uh, who's the author of a really good new book that I just read called The Great Successor. Um, and it's a book mostly about Kim Jong-un. And Fifield, what impresses me about her is, number one, she's traveled to North Korea a lot of times over the course of more than a decade. But she also, to write this book, traveled all around the world and talked directly with people who raised Kim Jong-un when he was a kid, people who went to school with him, people who knew him as he was growing up. Um, and so as far as like a verifiable history of this guy, I think she's done the best job that I've come across. And like that's part of why I was able to do this episode is I found her book and finally felt like I had something solid to grab onto and knew that I wasn't going to be taken in by a bunch of satirical Chinese uh, uh, comedy articles <laughs> that got misinterpreted as real. Yeah, And also a big thanks to the Kim family that will be joining us in 20 minutes. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's let's get into this. Let's if I'm going to give uh, people a useful history of uh, the Kim dynasty, I think we have to start with Kim Jong Un's grandfather, Kim Il Sung. Uh, on October 14th, 1945, more than 100,000 people filled the streets of downtown Pyongyang to celebrate the liberation of their country from Japanese occupation forces. Now, North Korea was at that point under the protection and governance of the USSR, and on that fateful day, a Soviet general addressed the crowd and introduced them to someone who would later be the new leader of their country, Comrade Kim Il-sung. Uh, the North Korean crowd was surprised to see a heavy-set young man in his 30s take the podium and address 
their new nation. People were shocked by his appearance because Kim Il-sung, like I said, was kind of a, a, a heavy set dude. He looked like a soft, lazy government bureaucrat, which is more or less what he was. Mm-hmm. But Soviet propaganda up until this point had been sort of hyping him up to the people as a badass guerrilla fighter who'd spent years battling the Japanese in the mountains and working towards the liberation of his people. Uh, according to the South China Morning Post, quote, his real name was not Kim Il-sung, but Kim Sung-kai. He was born in 1912 into a Presbyterian family that was comfortably off. His father was a teacher and an elder in the church. In 1920, like many other Koreans, they moved to Manchuria to escape famine and Japanese rule. His father died in 1926. He attended the UN Middle School in Jilin from 1927 to 1930 when he was arrested for subversion and imprisoned for several months. By 1935, he joined the anti-Japanese guerrilla war. His greatest moment came in June 1937 when his unit of 200 men captured a a small Japanese-held town in Korea for a few hours. By the end of 1940, the Japanese had killed his fellow commanders and many of his men. Those who remained crossed the Amur River into the Soviet Union. And that's the extent of Kim Il-sung's uh, career as a mountain warrior. Um, so he's billed as the guy who is responsible for orchestrating the campaign to oust the Japanese government uh, and sort of portrayed as being an equivalent to, like, Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. Um, but... The reality is that he was just kind of a mid-level guerrilla leader and by the end of the fighting was just one of the only ones who was left alive. But he he didn't really have much of a career actually fighting the Japanese. Not a coincidence Um, that he comes from privilege, of course. No, uh, no. And not a coincidence. Like he didn't he didn't spend much time in North Korea itself until he was 30. Uh, (laughs) And he actually didn't speak the language very well. He spoke Russian better than Korean. Um, Holy shit. So. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he gave his first speeches, they were actually written in Korean for him by Soviet uh, speechwriters who knew the language better and were able to like craft it for him. So, so it, was like, it was like a corporate like, That's how sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly kind of what goes on here. Um, so Kim, after he fled into the Soviet Union, but before the Japanese uh, were kicked out of Korea, he spent most of his time on a Russian military base, uh, where he was trained as a captain in the Red Army and remained until the end of the war. He had his first son on that army base, Kim Jong-il. Uh, in February of 1941. But that's not the history most North Koreans know. According to North Korean history books, Kim Jong-il was born on February 16th, 1942, in a secret military base on the Korean mountain uh, uh, Paiktu, uh, which is like a sacred mountain there. Um, and the reason that they changed the date is so that his birth date would be a year that ends in two, because his dad was born in a year that ended in two, and they wanted it to be like, yeah. 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 That's, it's, more, it's, uh, it's, that's more corporate posturing. Yeah. Yeah, it's branding. It's branding. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, as I as I stated, Kim Il-sung had not been a major figure in the Korean Communist Party prior to the country's liberation of Japan. He was like kind of a mid-level dude. Mm-hmm. And the story of how he came to rule the country anyway is a typical tale of, of Stalin era. Yeah, branding would be a really good way to look at it. Um, he started angling for the job when he was in that Russian military base, but Moscow at first felt he was too ambitious and didn't want to risk uh, giving him the gig. So Stalin and his guys initially backed a dude named Cho Man Sik, who was a nationalist who'd run a nonviolent reformist movement under the occupation. Uh, his big inspirations were Leo Tolstoy and Mahatma Gandhi. But Cho wasn't interested in being a puppet of the USSR. He wanted uh, North Korea to be an independent country. Um, and so the Soviets started to kind of sour on this guy more and more as the time to release North Korea as an independent nation drew closer, and they realized that he didn't want to be, you know, essentially their their man in Pyongyang. Um, so Kim Il-sung sort of slid into this gap that started to form between Cho and uh, the Russian the, or the Soviet leadership. Um, and the way he did this was by buying shitloads of liquor and prostitutes for the Soviet generals who were managing North Korea at this point and throwing them big raucous parties. Which worked, you know. Uh, yeah, well, they, I, that, I mean, yeah, he's yeah. a big opportunist is what it sounds yeah. like, which is uh, yeah. the only way you get to a place like that. I don't think there's any way you can get there by being any shred of a decent person. No, and it sounds like Cho was too honest about what he wanted for his people and what he thought was best for North Korea, whereas uh, uh, Kim Il-sung was kind of the, I'm going to tell these people whatever they need to hear mm-hmm. to, to put me in that job. 
Uh, and it worked. It worked out great for him. Uh, the Soviets uh, had Kim Il-sung deliver a speech test written by Soviet officials. Uh, the speech did not go well. Um, Cho's secretary later described him as speaking in a duck-like voice with a haircut like a Chinese waiter. Uh, <laughs> he was said to look like a fat delivery boy from a neighborhood Chinese food stall. Uh, others called him a fraud or a Soviet uh, stooge. So he was not, you know, initially it didn't look like uh, you know, he, he'd succeeded in sort of charming some of the Soviets, but he just had zero charisma. Um, so again, like it, it, it looks like kind of a long shot at the start. Mm-hmm. Um, but Cho keeps making more and more demands for real independence for North Korea as the, uh, the months go on. And eventually Stalin gets fed up with it and has that guy arrested and disappeared into a gulag somewhere. Wow. So yeah. Kim Il-sung gets promoted uh, a number of times in the last few days of the Soviet occupation, and on September 9th, 1948, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was officially founded, with Kim Il-sung as its leader. In less than a year, he adopted the title Great Leader and started having statues built in his honor. He rewrote the history book so that his first speech was written down as a tremendous success rather than him looking like uh, an overweight waiter. Um, but By, by know, the way, he, I just want to yeah. say that it's always funny to me whenever... Um, these kinds of takeovers happen and they call it something democratic. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. It's the same thing with like putting family in your, uh, your political organization. (laughs) Like, yeah, there's some words that always signal that they mean the opposite. And like, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of them. Um, cause yeah, there was no, there was no democracy at work here. Um, (laughs) there was no, nobody went to the North Korean people and was like, who do you guys, uh, yeah. What should be in charge. <laughs> and to be super fair, uh, there was not really democracy in South Korea at this point, which is an, an, an important thing to note. So North and South Korea had been officially split by the U.S. and the USSR at the end of World War II. You've probably heard of the 38th parallel, the line that divides the two nations to this day. Mm-hmm. The line was actually picked by an American colonel, Dean Rusk, and another army officer when they grabbed a National Geographic map and just sort of drew a line in a place that looked good to them. Um, and because nobody in the Soviet Union really cared that much at the time, they said it was fine. Um, and so, like, North Korea and South Korea were created without anybody really thinking about why the border had been drawn where it was. <laughs> um yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's like a Sykes Picot kind of story where you just have these two powers who like they've got so much else on their hands after like every, they're all focused about like splitting up Germany, right? The U.S. and sure. the USSR. Like nobody gives a shit about Korea at this point, so they like they just draw have two guys draw a line on a map, and uh, the U.S. says, "Yeah, that seems good," and the Soviets say, "Yeah, that seems good," and uh, nobody I, I, thinks any more about it. I picture it, it a pina- like someone just put on a blindfold and they're like, all right, just go with the marker, man. And then they were like, that's it. We got it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's a weird flip of the coin meant story that, uh, I ke- yeah, that's wild. Yeah, yeah, nobody, like that. there's literally like that, that, that almost is more planning than they put into it because at least then somebody would have had to find blindfolds. <laughs> like, there's some logistical uh, <laughs> like uh, necessity in, in at least that. Um, so once he gets into power, Kim Il-sung kind of feels shaky in it. Number one, there's a lot of other people who are guerrilla leaders during, uh, the occupation who aren't big fans of his. Um, he doesn't really have, he's seen as maybe being sort of a Russian, you know, uh, uh, agent at this point because he owes his power to them. And he feels like he needs more than, uh, statues of himself to solidify his rule he needs a war, and the best way for him to sort of uh, lock himself in as the leader of North Korea for life, he thinks, is to take over South Korea. Um, So he starts pushing Stalin to let him invade South Korea and reunify the peninsula. Um, And, you know, Stalin, at this point, North Korea is essentially under the thumb of both the USSR and China, because obviously it shares its big border with China. It was reliant on the Soviet Union for all of its food and aid and resources and whatnot. So, like, it, it, they couldn't really do anything without the approval of both countries. So Kim Il-sung goes to Stalin and is like, I want to take over South Korea. And Stalin kind of does the whole, 
go ask your mother sort of thing and it's basically like if mousy dung says it's okay then like well it'll be fine like then i'll then i'll i'll sign on to it so Kim Il-sung goes to Mao, and he eventually gets both dictators on board, and on June 25th, 1950, the North Korean People's Army invades South Korea. Um, And this is a really successful invasion at that point, because the South Korean uh, military did not exist in a super organized way. So within a, a matter of weeks, they basically conquer everything but one city in South Korea called Busan. Um... So they come very close in the early days of the war to just knocking South Korea out as a country and unifying the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, very, very close. Uh, The United States rushed in reinforcements, and the Battle of Pusan perimeter was fought, leading to more than 120,000 casualties on both sides. The United States, you know, continued to send in more and more men, including the 5th Regimental Combat Team, which included my grandfather. Uh, And in a series of daring landings and offensives, they pushed the North Korean army almost to China. Then China counterattacked and uh, pushed the United States back down past the 38th parallel, and the Korean War turns into a big, ugly shit show. Uh, A tremendous number of people died, uh, mostly from bombing campaigns carried out by the United States. Our bombers leveled, by some counts, 85% of the structures in North Korea. So that's not just 85% of its industry, 85% of its... 85% of all buildings in the country are gone. U.S. bomber commanders late in the Korean War complain about not having targets to hit because there's just nothing left in the country. (laughs) <laughs> I love that it's a complaint and not a not yeah. ju- they didn't state it as a fact. They're like we're we're running out of stuff and I'm I'm and I'm bored. I got nothing I got nothing to drop my bombs on. Yeah. I'm just bombing nonsense at this point. Yeah, it it was an unspeakably devastating war for the North, and obviously it ended in essentially a stalemate, not even really peace. North Korea lost at least 10% and maybe as many as like 20 to 25% of its pre-war population in the fighting. Just absolutely devastating. Um, Apocalyptic violence. And the sheer scale of the devastation that's wrought on North Korea allows Kim Il-sung to not just hang into power, but reinforce his own power. Um, Because, number one, just the disastrous losses suffered give him, like, he's able to pick people who were his enemies in the uh, in the Korean military to blame them for all of the deaths and like have those people executed and purged. And so by the end of the war, North Korea is about as wrecked as a country has ever been. But Kim Il-sung's power is fucking locked down. Yeah. So that's where we are when the Korean War ends. Uh, what year did it end? We are, uh, 1953, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, I remember it being short but impactful because, you know, obviously yeah. I know the U.S. lost a lot of men there. Yeah, we lost about 33,000 or 37,000 dead in that war, which is, you know, only about 20 or so thousand off from the number who died in Vietnam, which lasted more than three times as long. Um, <laughs> so it's very short. Like, for an example of how brutal it was, my grandpa was one of the first soldiers who like one of the first American soldiers who landed in Korea fighting in the war. He was there the whole war. He landed in Korea as a sergeant and he left as a major um, wow. because just so many of the guys above him got killed or wounded that they were just promoting anyone like they could to fill like spaces in the leadership they needed. Wow. Um, which isn't a thing that really happens anymore. Um, yeah. But yeah, it did back then. So it's it's a it's an ugly war and it's ugliest for North Korea. Like they get hit by far the hardest. And our listeners are about to get hit the hardest by some ads for products and services. This is a really bad ad plug. Or um, the greatest ad sway- segue in the history of ads. I don't know which yes. one. Yeah, let let these ads destroy 85% of the buildings <laughs> in your heart. I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to, I should have picked a different point to lead us into ads from, but this is where we are. You can't, can't go back now. You're, look, you're bombing them with capitalism. Yeah, we're bombing them with capitalism. <laughs> buy, buy our beautiful dick pills. Products! We're back! Oh, boy. Those, those nothing like some products and services to, to get you back into talking about the world's most uh successful and long-lived communist regime the next segue Uh, should be and speaking of dictatorships here's our you know (laughs) ah damn it you're right it's right in the name ah 
I'm so frustrated that it took you mentioning that for me to realize there was a dick pills dictator pun to be had. <laughs> well, it hit me afterwards, and I was like, ah, I was a beat too late. Man, I can't believe it took me this long to have that idea. Um, <laughs> well, that's a shame. Anyway, so uh, North Korea is super fucked up at the end of uh, the Korean War. Um, But this winds up actually being sort of a benefit to it in the same way that like Japan, because it was so devastated after World War Two, a bunch in Germany, a bunch of like foreign aid went in and rebuilt all the industry. And they wound up with like brand new factories, brand new everything. And it set them up to become an economic powerhouse. That kind of happens to North Korea in the wake of the Korean War. Uh, China and the USSR flood the country with resources and they rebuild the national industries. And this will surprise most people because we think about North Korea as dirt poor and South Korea as, you know, opulent and wealthy. But up until the mid-1970s, North Korea had a larger economy and in many ways a higher quality of life than South Korea. That's like the first 20 years of Kim Il-sung's reign. Um, And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, The short explanation is that North Korea contains almost all of the peninsula's industrial resources, coal and steel and fuel. All the valuable shit is in the north. The south is traditionally Korea's agricultural heartland. And for those first couple of decades, South Korea was also basically run by a dictatorship. So for a long time after the Korean War... A lot of people who lived in South Korea might have thought like, oh, we made it, we really fucked up by not going up north. Um, Like you could you could have thought felt for a while that like the people who wound up in the north of the country got a better deal Um, because it seemed that way until the 70s when the trend starts to reverse itself very fucking quickly. South Korea industrializes at an incredibly rapid rate uh, and then their GDP, their quality of life and the the level of actual like they become a functional democracy as well. Also, I I just want to say that one thing that I think people um, forget is that even within these places, there's still an insane class divide. It's just that middle class was a more feasible thing back then, maybe. But I feel like, uh, I mean, obviously, and also resources to information and, and truly knowing what North Korea was like, you were only seeing what was coming in newsreels in front of um, movies or radio commercials and, you know, however people got their media back then. But I think that, like, a lot of those places still. Um, you know, even if people looked like they were living well, there were still poor people in those places. Yeah, and that's part of why that that like that's part of why people in the north might have been for a chunk of this period happier than people in the south because uh, the north had more resources to put into kind of a functional sort of social welfare state than yeah. the south did for a chunk of this time. Huh. Um, but that, again, that starts to really reverse itself in the 70s. But the first 20 years or so of Kim Il-sung's reign, they're seen still today by the people who remember them as like the golden years of North Korea. Uh, and those the memory of those years is the cornerstone of of the power that the Kim family wields to this day. And that's a big part of why Kim Il-sung is remembered so fondly even today in North Korea, whereas Kim Jong-il really isn't. And it's a big part of the reason why Kim Jong-un is, is like, he, he ties himself more to his grandpa than his dad. He doesn't primarily bill himself as the son of Kim Jong-il. He uh, propaganda emphasizes how much he looks like his grandpa. There's even rumors that he got plastic surgery to resemble his grandfather. Like, he dresses the same. Like, he's very much trying to put on this, um, still to this day, trying to put forward this idea of, like, I'm going to bring us back to the good days, you know, when my grandpa was in charge. Make North Um, Korea great again. Yeah, make North Korea great again. He's he's really hearkening back to that. Um, and it's important to understand in order to understand sort of like how things are angled uh, to this day by the uh, the Kim regime in North Korea. So, starting in the 1970s, uh, Kim Il-sung crafted a policy for his people called Jush. The basic idea of Jush uh, is similar to the desire for autarky expressed by Adolf Hitler uh, in the pre-war years. It's an ideology that the Korean people should and can be totally independent from the world outside of their borders. They don't need anything from other people. Um, now, Jush is not a really coherent ideology because it, uh, it I, for one thing, ignores the fact that North Korea was from the beginning deeply dependent on primarily food aid from the USSR and from China. Because remember, the Korean Peninsula, which had been unified for most of history, the South provides the food, the North has the industrial resources. So on its own, the North can't really grow that much food. Um, so they don't, they're, they're, 
Jush is more of a propaganda campaign than it's an example of like how North Korea actually functions because for the, up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, they're deeply dependent on the country for food aid. Um, and their economy is really dependent on having these other communist countries to sell to. You know, Jush is how Kim Il-sung wants people to think about North Korea and sort of its relationship to the world. Um, That's again but, a, yeah. like a fucking brand thing there happening. Yeah, it is a brand thing. Um, Absolutely. And it's crazy because like also I think uh any country at this point I, I what's really wild about it is like when w- people go for this whole concept of independence I, I thankfully, the more time goes on, I think people realize that's not the case with really anywhere. Uh, yeah, it, true, like true independence. But uh, again, it was that period where, like, I think specifically the the I think until about nineteen eighty, I'll say, and that's like an estimate. But up until that point, it was so easy to pull this kind of bullshit, like where you yeah. could you could just like put a buzzword. I mean, you could still do that well into the 80s and 90s and it's happening now obviously and like just with memes or pe- phrases people use, but I mean, in terms of like implementing these things on a on a national scale like that, it was so effortless to just be like, "All right, how can we get people to, you know, what whatever the 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 keyword is." Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh like that's part of why he adopts this ideology is, you know, in the mid-70s and into the 80s, the South pulls way ahead of North Korea, and suddenly there's no comparing the two countries. And that's a big reason why you want, if you're Kim Il-sung, to emphasize independence and why we don't need anyone else, is because you don't want your people seeing the outside world now that (laughs) uh, it's become increasingly clear that they're doing better than you. Right. Absolutely. Oh, my God. That's the... Yeah. That's the, uh, like, every... Man, I don't even know how to articulate this, but like that is, uh, I think, the key to most like it's like trying to keep every country as um, blindfolded as possible until the blindfold officially comes off. It's essentially like they're making a backup plan for when that finally happens because it's not sustainable. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's normally not sustainable. One of the things that's interesting about North Korea is they're the only country of its type that has sustained something like this. Yeah, you're right, actually. That's a great point. It's 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 still happening. Yeah, it's really, that's the most remarkable thing about this story, is that Kim Il-sung, number one, he has the goal that all smart dictators have, which is to die peacefully at home. Um, Number two, he has the goal to pass on rule to his son, Kim Jong-il, which no other, there's not a single case of another communist leader successfully passing on uh, rule to their, like, to to their own children, Mm -hmm. to their heir. Like, obviously, that didn't happen in the USSR, and in fact... Like the the idea of having a cult of personality faded in the USSR after Stalin's death, and they were like they they opened up and liberalized in yeah. a lot of ways after that. You don't see that in North Korea, and the reason why is because Kim Jong Un is a, a masterful does a masterful job of preparing his nation for the idea that there will be no break in continuity between the generations. So I'm going to read a quote from the Great Successor that talks about sort of how he goes about this process. The 1970 edition of North Korea's Dictionary of Political Terminology stated that hereditary secession is a reactionary custom of exploitative societies that was quietly dropped from future publications. State media started referring to the party center, a phrase used to obliquely refer to Kim Jong-il's activities without explicitly stating his name. And Kim Jong-il began to be promoted up the Workers' Party hierarchy. The North's allies picked up on Kim Il-sung's plans early on. The East German ambassador to Pyongyang cabled the foreign ministry in 1970 to say that North Koreans were being asked to swear loyalty to Kim Jong-il at Workers' Party meetings across the country in case something grave might happen to Kim Il-sung. So that starts in the mid-1970s, and it only escalates as the 1980s (laughs) and 1990s roll along. Um, And, you know, one of the other things that happens throughout the 1980s and 1990s is that it becomes increasingly obvious to Kim Il-sung and to Kim Jong-il that none of the other communist family dynasties are going to last. And in fact, yeah, like I said, no other communist state successfully handed down power from father to son. Mm -hmm. Um, So it looks like in the 80s and 90s, it looks like there's very long odds on Kim Jong-il actually taking power from his dad or staying in power once he takes it. Most experts suspect that like after Kim Il-sung dies, things are going to sort of fall apart, right? 
um, right. which will not be the last time, quote unquote, experts on North Korea predict stuff like this. Um, and they ain't been right yet. Uh, so at the Sixth Workers Party Congress in Pyongyang in 1980, Kim Jong il is made the official successor. Uh, and like that is announced to the entire country. He begins to accompany his father along in on the spot guidance tours, where the two Kims will show up at farms and factories and tell all of the people there how to do the jobs that they did every day. Workers are expected to take diligent notes as one career politician and his drunken playboy son uh, tell them how to forge steel and plow fields, which seems like. And it's like the worst episode of Undercover Boss. I, I was just thinking, I was like, this is the most wild thing I've ever heard in my life. Like, this is, and truly, you would never even catch a fucking CEO of any company going to a place and being like, okay, this is how you make uh, a latte. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's so interesting to me that they do it this way in North Korea. Because if you read about like Saddam Hussein, did the literal opposite, where he would, he would, you know, whether or not he actually did it, he made sure that there were stories of him dressing up in costume and, like, showing up at farmers' houses and factories to, like, see how people really thought about things, which, like, that's an old, that goes back, like, 2,000 years in the stories of, like, Arab rulers as, like, these Arab caliphs and stuff uh, hiding among the peasantry and trying to see how their lives really are to learn about how they can govern more justly. But, and it's the opposite here. And you know what? Like, that, I, I but I, I, it's a, it's a related ability aspect that I bet some people are just blown away that these guys are coming here and and being you know having a sense of utility or whatever it is that they're you know very uh, they're like oh they're getting down there and they're they're putting their hands in the mud uh, and and getting dirty and and you know they're working and th- and the fact is they're not and it's almost the same like the way I think of it is the way um, when you know Trump is like I go to McDonald's yeah like, you know how many people his fan base must eat that up no pun intended to be like oh my god he's he goes to the same place as i do he gets it so even though he's a billionaire he understands us yeah that was one of the it was really frustrating to me to see the way that um when he fed those like the the fast food to those <laughs> yeah, kids the- <laughs> how it was handled by the media because i i grew up in like the deep south uh and i know that played well to a lot of his uh, to a lot of his base. Like, totally. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, it started with my earliest memory of it when I was in college and even a little after that uh, in the in the last few years of the Bush presidency. I remember people still were like, this is a guy you could sit down and at least have a beer with. And I was like, that is fucking crazy that that's the takeaway in not only that, like when the economy's crumbling, then like, you know what? Maybe people we should be having beers with shouldn't be r- running. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's uh it's one of those things like one of the um, the big like the, the, there's this emphasis on the the Kims as being um in the propaganda as being perfect and is obviously is knowing better than all of their workers, but there's also this emphasis on how hard they work. Like there's a lot of stories that are put into the propaganda about them passing out from exhaustion and going without huh. sleep for days and like where like that's like the way it was phrased when Kim Jong-un died is he like he worked himself to death and his heart gave out. So <laughs> it is it is clearly important for the regime that like the leaders be seen as being as invested physically in the labor of 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 the country as like the actual people doing labor. I have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, in I, I don't know if this came up at any point in any of the things you were doing, and this isn't in regards to the interview, just in in general. Which is that uh, is there mention of what the arts are like? I feel like that's actually a play a spot. I I realize I've never looked at, which is what any because I, I you know I, I referenced that early on, but I do feel like that's usually a reflection of how people perceive things there and obviously it, it, it there's not a freedom of of artistic choice there yeah there, i mean there's a lot said in the great successor in particular about music in north korea and about its role and like um one like they they have particular songs that they use like when they were preparing kim jong un to take power there was a particular song called footsteps that they would play that was like the the lyrics in the song were supposed to kind of get people ready for the idea that someone was going to take over for Kim Jong Il. So it is there's not freedom of in, in the arts there, but there is a lot of emphasis pl- placed on the arts. It's also worth noting that the Kim family themselves, Kim Jong Il and his son and Kim Jong Un's brother, um, his surviving brother, are all huge Clapton fans. Gigantic <laughs> Eric Clapton, fucking love Eric Clapton. Amazing. Um, which like you know he's Eric Clapton. Like I get it. Like. 
But I honestly yeah. think those guys. Uh, I, I I've always thought that the people who are usually at the at the top of the food chain like that, who are who are suppressing art in any way, um, probably consume most. Uh, or I wouldn't say most because they're they're but a, a decent amount of of Western art, oh, yeah. European cinema, all that stuff, and not only a that, ton of it. I would venture to say they probably like some of it. Oh, they lo- they we'll talk about that a lot. They they're oh, huge fans of it. The whole like I mean, I, I, Kim Il Sung is I, I haven't heard anything about what he liked, but Kim Jong Il and Kim Jong Un, big fans of Western cinema, music, uh, art, big Am- Disneyland guys. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. So. Uh, In 1991, Kim Jong-il is pronounced the leader of the Korean People's Army. Uh, Now, these were the waning days of his father's regime, and they were not good years for communism around the world. Uh, The Soviet Union started falling apart in 1991, and it became increasingly clear that North Korea was about to be standing alone for real. Kim Il-sung's ideas about jush and independence would finally be put to the test. And the country did not handle being isolated well. The collapse of the USSR meant North Korea lost one of its major trading partners and its largest source of food. This coincided with a series of mudslides that wiped out huge amounts of the nation's crops and led to mass starvation and even cannibalism among the populace. As many as two million people may have died during this period. The government's power began to crumble, and huge numbers of North Koreans started buying, selling, and smuggling in direct contravention of the law. Jong Il and his father found themselves in a precarious position. Kim Jong-un knew that he would die soon, and he had to find a way to guarantee a safe transition of power for his son. But how do you orchestrate that at a time when your people are starving to death en masse? Like, that's the that's the big question Jong-un has to answer in, like, the early 1990s. Um, and the answer that he picked, at least, was to come up with a lurid fairy tale about his family's origins. So, I'm going to quote again from The Great Successor. To bolster the case for hereditary succession in these challenging circumstances, the regime created a fantastical story about Kim Jong-il's provenance that borrowed heavily from both Korean mythology and Christianity. He would be leader not simply because he had been appointed by his father, but because he had some divine right. His birthplace became not a guerrilla camp, uh, but Mount Paiktu, the volcano on North Korea's border with China that has legendary status in Korean culture. It is said to be the birthplace of Tangun, the mythical half-bear, half-deity father of the Korean people. The creature conferred a heavenly origin on the Korean people, and thanks to the story, Kim Jong-il appeared to come from heaven too. North Korea's propagandists didn't stop there. They said that Kim Jong-il was born in a wooden cabin and that a single bright star shone in the sky at his birth. They stopped short of making the building a manger or his mother a virgin, but, for good measure, they added a double rainbow spontaneously appearing over the mountain. The myth of the Holy Pike II bloodline was created. Wow. What's amazing about that is that is exactly what uh, the parallel of religion here, obviously, that's not treated as um, mythical in that way, but it 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 it's the same difference as like George W. thinking God picked him to be president. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a classical example of uh, the kind of thing that a regime puts out and and pushes when it it feels insecure. Like that's yes. why that's that's when the crazy stuff starts to happen in North Korean propaganda. Um, because you don't see as much of that with Kim Il Sung. Like you, you, he had a, he had a pretty wild cult of personality, um, but it was kind of in line with Stalin and other leaders of of that era. Sure. Um, whereas it gets just fucking batty with Kim Jong Il, and it gets progressively battier. And it's because Kim Jong Il comes to power as North Korea collapses completely. Um, so like one of the things that happens in the nineties with everyone starving is that like bits and pieces of capitalism enter the country because the government can't like people are starving and things are so bad. The government can't stop people from, from smuggling in food and setting up rudimentary markets and stuff. And so like that becomes a thing at this point in time and they just don't have a solid enough grip on power to fight it. So instead they start pushing out ever more lurid and wild propaganda. Which is, I'm sure, how people got to the point of, like, specifically Americans selling. I mean, they had already done this when when Reagan was in office, but you know, these like anti-socialist. They they treated socialism and communism as like the Venn diagram being a complete circle. Yeah, and and, and I'm sure yeah. this was a great paradigm for them of how it's a failure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things. Like, it's. Uh... There are a number of different ways to look at what's happened in North Korea. Um, one of the best descriptions I've heard of the uh, the way that the state is organized is that it is essentially like the whole state exists to serve uh, 
it's kind of, it's almost organized like a corporation wherein the whole state exists to serve the Kim family who are in like they're the like the couple five ten percent of people who are in power who are like mm-hmm. the actual stakeholders in the regime. Um, that's that's one way you'll see it framed. Like there's there's not a lot of like with uh, the Soviet Union and stuff. Um, there's none of what you actually saw called for in like Marx's theory where like workers own the means of production. Like that does not happen whatsoever in North Korea or in the USSR really. Um, So it's, yeah. uh, uh, What it definitely shows is that uh, when you have a government um, that because of its belligerent policies doesn't trade with the rest of the world and that government can't grow enough food uh, to feed its people, then those people will do a better job of servicing their own needs than the government can, which is like the same story that you see out of, uh, it's the same story that you see in uh, Hurricane Katrina after like FEMA fucked up in the first several weeks after like that, where it's like the actual people who live there do a better job of taking care of each other than the government did. It's, it's actually um, almost like they took douche back. Yeah. Yeah, it it, 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 it is. It's like the actual people... Um, like the the lesson that they could take out of that is like we didn't actually need the regime because the regime like we like we are capable of being independent if the regime gets out of our way which is a great that's, yeah I, I, which is a, a a really constant reminder to me of what a thin veil most advertisements propaganda like anything I'm, I'm talking politics economics all of it is between how people are sold things very easily and how it it literally isn't that far off from because that's that's when people talk about like revolutions being I- idealistic or not possible. I I would say this almost argues that it, it it's much easier. It's just a matter of mobilization or being pushed so far that what happened happened. Yeah, and you 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 do see like pieces of that um, in North Korea. It never develops into anything that threatens the stability of the regime itself. Right. Um, but it does alter like the. It never goes back either. Like once these once people get used to the idea of running their own rudimentary markets and selling some of their own crops and like one of the like you, you know you, a lot of people would get involved in like little businesses where they would like uh, harvest like corn husks and make corn noodles and stuff and then sell them to other people in towns so that they could afford enough food to eat. And like once people start doing that and independently servicing their own needs, you can't go back mm-hmm. to the way things were yeah. beforehand. And that's like that that that's definitely shown here. Um it's time for ads. Uh we don't have another great lead in for ads. Uh but it's, when it's we time come for back, it's time for your juice, everybody. Yeah, it's time for you to be independent by buying the products and services advertised on this show. Yay. We're back, and it's time we finally start talking about Kim Jong-un. Now, the boy who would retroactively be declared the latest member of the Holy Pike II bloodline, Kim Jong-un, was not born to be the inheritor of the Kim regime. Jong-un came into this world in 1984, appropriately enough. North Korean propagandists, however, (laughs) later rewrote history to claim that he'd been born in 1982, so it would be in line with Kim Il-sung's real 1912 birthday and Kim Jong-il's falsified 1942 birth. Um, But that would come later. Because North Korea's current supreme ruler was born the son of his father's mistress, not the son of his father's official wife. Uh, And in fact, Kim Il-sung did not know that Kim Jong-un existed for the first several years of his life because Kim Jong-il kept his mistresses hidden from his dad and also his first kids. Now, Kim Jong-un was his father's third son. His first son, Kim Jong-nam, uh, who was the guy who got assassinated in that airport by those women who, like, rubbed him with poison more recently. Like, he was also the son of one of Kim Jong-il's mistresses. Now, Kim Jong-il never married Kim Jong-nam's mom or Kim Jong-un's mother, but he did force them to, like, divorce their other partners and move in to isolated mansions in Pyongyang. Can, can I just say this truly is now behind the bastard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're very very behind him still the, at this the, point. The pun is truly lived up to the name. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Kim's second two sons were with a dancer, Ko Young Hui. Jung Il moved them into a compound in Pyongyang, separate from his other family members. So he has like a couple of different mistresses and kids with each of these mistresses. And he has them all in separate walled compounds that are all around his mansion, which is walled off from the outside world, but also walled off from all of his mistresses and all of his kids' homes. Um, and these are, they just spend hundreds of millions of dollars buying these giant facilities, which exist to protect both Kim and jong il and his uh his lovers and kids from their people but also to protect kim from his mistresses and his children um and allow him to like lock them away in their separate little chunks of the compound if he wants and they grow up very 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 isolated um at best they were allowed to play with their cousins occasionally but usually they were kept alone uh his oldest son jong nam was kept separate from uh Kim uh, Jong-un and from his uh, other brother. So, like, the brothers don't spend much time together. They don't have friends. Um, inside their lonely compounds, the uh, separated Jong-il children lived lives of isolated splendor. They had 15-foot gates on beachfront compounds with amusement park rides built into them, the latest televisions and video games, pinball machines, dirt bikes, dune buggies, jet skis. Whole buildings were filled with toys for the boys and girls, just up to the rafters with Legos and stuff. Um, the latest of, of anything coming out of the West was available. They had uh, toy guns that like fired realistic bullets made specifically for them. They also had plenty of real guns, uh, like any self-respecting dictator's son, yep. Kim Jong un was given a 45 caliber handgun uh when he was 11 years old he was given a specially modified car that he could drive and see above the steering wheel in when he was seven years old wow um, like richie so, rich. yeah yeah he's he, he grows up like richie rich um but he's not allowed to have friends like that's that's uh like his closest friend as a child as far as we know was a middle-aged japanese sushi chef uh named fujimoto um oh, and God. Fujimoto's an interesting dude. He lives in Japan now, and his, like, business cards essentially say, like, ask me if you have questions about the Kim family, because he got hired to work for them in the 80s and 90s, and was, like, his story about it, and he does have a lot of pictures with Kim Jong-un and definitely was around, is that Kim Jong-il, at a certain point, asked him to be his son's playmate, uh, since there were never any real kids around. And so Kim Jong-un would listen to Fujimoto's Whitney Houston records, uh, and like ogle his Air Jordan sneakers and stuff, and uh, you know they would uh, the, the 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 like that was his the closest thing he had to a real friend was this like kind of weird Japanese dude who took a job in North Korea because it sounded different, um, and was willing to like spend fifteen years cooking sushi for a dictator. That's his like best buddy growing up. Yeah, and also being his like entry to pop culture. <laughs> Yes, and also being his entry to Western culture. Um, so he he seems like an interesting guy. Um, in interviews with Anda Fifield, Fujimoto recalled a moment at around age 10 when Kim Jong-un got angry at his aunt for calling him little brother. Jong-un yelled at her, don't treat me like a child. Fujimoto then suggested he go by the nickname Comrade General instead of little brother, which stuck. Everyone started calling him Comrade General after that. So I'm like his grandfather, Fujimoto said. So, love the name. Uh, hey, Captain Major. Like, what is yeah. that? That is ridiculous. Comrade General. Well, this is complicated by the fact that he actually is appointed a general as a small child uh, and has a uniform with general stars on it. And, you know, when he's walking around with a gun, he's doing it in a military uniform um, because that's just the way it works in a dictatorship. Yeah, that's not even an implication. It's an actual thing that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty great. So Kim Jong-un's birthday parties tended to take place at the Kim family compound in Wonsan, which is essentially North Korea's answer to Hawaii. Uh, No children were invited to his parties, and instead the aging leadership cast of North Korea showed up to celebrate with an eight-year-old boy, which had to have been super fun. Uh, I'm going to guess he didn't have a lot of competition if they played GoldenEye. Um, probably, (laughs) Probably fucking kicked kick their asses is odd job i wonder if i wonder if uh the other if he played anyone if they were allowed to win or if they had to lose yeah i feel like if you pick if like especially if you pick odd job playing goldeneye with kim jong-un and start like karate chopping him to death like you don't last much longer after that (laughs) like yeah that's not a good good plan for you 
Uh, so Kim Jong-un was known as a child for loving machinery. He was particularly fascinated with model planes. According to the great successor, even when he was eight or nine and still in Pyongyang, Kim Jong-un would stay up all night doing experiments with his machinery and insisting on speaking to some expert or another, even in the wee hours of the morning, if he couldn't figure things out by himself. When he had questions or when something didn't function well, he would call for a nautical engineer to come and explain it to him, no matter how late it was, his aunt told me. So he's like... In some ways, like, that sounds like it could, uh, uh, you could expect someone to grow up with a lot of talent doing that. Like, if you actually have an interest in engineering and you can just force engineers to wake up in the middle of the night and explain things to you, like, sure, I mean, that's see that, yeah, yeah, any, any, like, and that's the here's the thing for kids, that's not that uncommon either, whether you're good at it or not, or what, what what your fascination is with them. So, I, I wonder. It's pro- it's probably one of the only things like let's say you were talking about earlier how like ten years from now how much of this might still track that part probably still does it sounds like an yeah. innocuous but uh, enough thing in regards to what someone that age would be into as opposed to wearing a general's uniform which also obviously really happened uh, yeah and, and holding guns <laughs> I mean if if you when I was seven years old or eleven years old you'd given me a forty five and and made me a general uh, I would have. I would have probably invaded a couple of countries and it would have gone really badly. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess we got to give the kid credit for some, uh, some restraint there, or at least his dad. Now, yeah. <laughs> uh, basketball is huge in Korea, in both Koreas, yeah. both South and North Korea, big fucking basketball fans. And it's something of a trope in Korean culture for mothers to tell their children to play basketball. So they will grow up taller. That's a common myth. Uh, so Kim Jong Il was just like five foot two, very very short dude. Uh, Kim Jong Un grew up to be like five foot seven. Um, so you know uh, you could argue that uh, maybe maybe all the basketball he played as a kid helped him in fact grow up a little bit taller. Um, it's it's definite. One of the things we know to a point of certainty about Kim Jong Un is that for basically all of his life he has been absolutely obsessed with basketball. Uh, children of rich party apparatchiks would be bussed in to play games with him. Fujimoto observed, He had the ability to make good judgments with solid reasoning. He knew when to praise and when to criticize. Fujimoto noted that he seemed to particularly enjoy critiquing players, especially due to the fear this provoked in them. He learned from an early age to enjoy exercising power over people. One story Fujimoto tells is of another time is of a time he took Kim Jong Un and one of his brothers out fishing for sea bass. Every time he Fujimoto would catch a bass, pre-team Kim Jong Un would grab the rod and shout, "I caught it!" So we're getting an idea for the kind of personality that develops um, sure. from a kid who grows up in this. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, he he got the the dictatorship uh, yeah. crash course early on. Yeah, yeah, he grows up very comfortable with acting that way. Uh, On July 8th, 1994, Kim Il-sung's heart finally gave out after decades of hard living and a harder dictating. Kim Jong-un was 10 years old and still technically a secret to the people of North Korea at the time. They were certainly aware of his father, Kim Jong-il, though, because he'd been the promised successor for many years. Kim Il-sung was hailed by the Korean Central News Agency as a man who had turned North Korea from a land where age-old backwardness and poverty had prevailed into a powerful socialist country, independent, self-supporting, and self-reliant. The rest of the 1990s increasingly put the lie to this claim, as North Korea's terrible famine hit its height not long after Kim Jong-il took power. Now, I can remember when this, like, in the early 2000s, when I was just starting off in my career writing for Cracked, that we had a number of popular articles run that referenced uh, all the crazy claims about Kim Jong-il. And there was a period of years there, especially in the early 2000s, where he was the Western world's, like, favorite punching bag. Um, Team America World Police is probably, like, the clearest example. Yeah, that's the biggest example of this. Um, And there were a lot of really crazy lies told about Kim Jong-il, especially as the famine subsides in the early 2000s and things start to recover. Um, And there's, you know, you hear stories about uh, he he wrote perfect operas. He'd play a single perfect game of golf and then quit the game forever. There was propaganda that said he was a world fashion icon that said he'd invented (laughs) the hamburger that said he'd never used a toilet. And of course, that would claim he could control the weather. 
Um, These colorful tales made North Korea's dictator fun to write about, but the lies came from a place of desperation. Things were bad in North Korea for most of this period, and the regular people knew it. Kim Jong-il's insane propaganda was the result of a desperate regime with very little to really brag about. His father's difficult early years were mostly lost on Kim Jong-un, because during this period of time, he continued to live in armed compounds, uh, eating sushi prepared by a private chef, flying to Paris to see Euro Disney, uh, and while his citizens were eating grass and pages from books to quell their hunger pains, the heir apparent got to enjoy the finest buffets Europe had to offer. He played in rooms full of Legos in his private palace. Uh, He and the other Kims ain't only a special rice produced for them in dedicated farms. Female harvesters would select each grain by hand, making sure they were all perfect and the same size. So this is his his childhood while starvation is going on. It's really important to keep that in mind. Of course, yeah. And I think people... Um, I don't know why this can still be a, th- a, a mystery to some people, but like, you know, people look back on certain things like, how could people let this happen or how could people sit idly by? And um, all you have to do is look around now um, to a lot of what has happened since uh, Trump's been in office, which is that like, you know, all of the it, it, it's it's very easy for it to happen. And uh, and it's very hard for people to there's overthrowing that in any capacity. That's I guess what I'm getting at more is the parts of the propaganda that are like, you know, this guy never had to go to the bathroom and he invented the hamburger. Um, you know, I, I'm of course, most people didn't believe it, but also it's not going to change anything in the sense that people aren't going to suddenly be like, that's a crock of shit. Let's uh, we need someone else here. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's just there's just not room for that um, right. in this society. And part of it's just because like the media is so controlled that like even if people aren't buying all the propaganda, there's no room for anything else to enter into like public media. Space. And if, if you push it enough times just the repetition of it people are going to be uh, are going to wear down to it in any yeah it, it, right we'll talk a little bit more about that later too um so kim jong-il's infamous propaganda campaigns were yeah more of a holding strategy than anything else while well, he shifted his nation to a military first domestic policy uh some people might consider it odd to focus your money and attention on more soldiers and gaining nuclear missiles while people are eating each other but kim jong-il knew what he was doing the military kept him in power as the 1990s rolled along kim jong nam jong-un's older half-brother grew increasingly estranged from his father and from the levers of power in north korea he was disgraced when he and his mother were caught with fake passports trying to enter japan in order to see Tokyo Disneyland. The fake name he traveled under, Pang Zhang, translated to Fat Bear, a fact which made him a laughingstock of world media. <laughs> yeah, uh, very funny. Kim Jong Nam's fading star also came from the fact that his mother spent most of her time in Russia rather than sucking up to Kim Jong Il. According to the great successor, Kim Jong Un's mother, on the other hand, became a constant presence in Kim Jong Il's life. As his favorite consort, she planted the seeds of change from behind the scenes. Her influence came to be seen everywhere, such as in the way Donald Duck and Tom and Jerry cartoons suddenly appeared on television, dubbed into Korean, right around the time her children would have been watching them. Around the same time, Kim Jong Il had flown into a rage when he discovered that Kim Jong Nam, who was then about 20, had been going out and drinking in Pyongyang. For disobeying his orders, Kim Jong Il put Kim Jong Nam's household under arrest for a month, cutting off their food supplies and making them clean up after themselves. Um, So that's that's the kind of punishment you get as the son of a dictator. (laughs) I was just going to say, you got to clean your own house. Yeah, yeah. yeah, The the humanity. Where is it? Yeah. Now, uh, Kim Jong-un famously spent most of his adolescence in Bern, Switzerland. To be specific, he and his older brother, Kim Jong-chol, his other older brother, lived in the suburb of Liebfeld with their maternal aunt and uncle. They lived under assumed names, and no one but high-ranking Swiss security services realized who they truly were. To their credit, the Swiss intelligence agencies, like, knew that the children of, like, North Korea's dictator were there, but had a policy of not really keeping tabs on them because they were kids, and they felt like they they deserve a chance to be children, um, which I think is admirable. Um, Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, for the most part, it seems like Kim Jong-un and his older brother were allowed to live the closest approximation of a normal life possible for the children of dictators, at least during the times when they were in Switzerland. Years later, Kim Jong-un's aunt, Koi Young-suk, recalled, We lived in a normal home and acted like a normal family. I acted like their mother. Their friends would come over and I would make them snacks. It was a very normal childhood with birthday parties and gifts and Swiss kids coming over to play. So that's, that's, yeah, yeah. There there was a brief period where like he 
almost had a normal middle class upbringing. Like you, you see, you see like glimmers of that in in this kid's life. Like they, um, and, and it's hard to tell whether it was like pushed upon him or that's what they were striving for. You know what he I mean? Seems, he se- like they were striving for him to get a good education because his right. mom would regularly visit and like chastise him for not getting better grades, and they just knew that he wasn't going to be able to get a good enough education um, in North Korea because like for one thing. Um, it's kind of hard to get a good education when the teachers are afraid you might have them shipped to gulags. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Kim Jong-un maintained his love of model airplanes. While he lived in Switzerland, he went out with his aunt and uncle on vacations to the French Riviera and to Euro Disney. Like every child of the 1990s, of course, he and his... Classic. Yeah, yeah. He and his older brother developed an intense and abiding love for the action films of Jean-Claude Van Damme. Which you know, of course. Now we're getting the, really into the the yeah. W- what I'm very curious about because the ni- yeah. '90s in particular, uh, specifically for movies, is about when it became. I, I guess when e- even like indie films kind of had an assembly line model, almost. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and it's one of the things that in- that's interesting to me here is that uh, yeah, he was also a huge fan of Michael Jackson. Um, like he really seems to be like a pretty normal. Like, I think most of the people listening who grew up in the 90s could have had long and engaged conversations with Kim Jong-un as kids about, like, you know, the Street Fighter movie or whatever. Oh, yeah. I can't. Uh, I I saw every single Sudden Impact, Lionheart, uh, Universal Soldier, Hard Target. Those are all his big early 90s movies right there. And Kim Jong-un's older brother, Kim Jong-chol, even included Jean-Claude Van Damme in an essay he wrote at school. Uh, And we have a quote from it. Uh, If I had my ideal world, I would not allow weapons and atom bombs anymore. I would destroy all terrorists with the Hollywood star Jean-Claude Van Damme. Everybody would be happy. No more war. No more dying. No more crying. So that's uh, uplifting. I wonder what they thought of the... I don't know if you remember this, when Universal Soldier came out at the Cannes Film Festival. I believe it was at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, Jean-Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren had a shoving match. (laughs) Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, there, it was. It was. It, it turned out it was a publicity stunt for the movie. Oh. But I picture them being like, "Oh man, he could have owned Dolph Lundgren. Oh man, he could have really." Uh, which is funny because Dolph Lundgren. I don't know if most people know this. He has like a PhD in I think like chemistry. Yeah, he's a genius and also a a a, a living mountain. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dolph Lundgren is a is a terrifying fellow. Um, yeah, that's a sidebar, yeah. but yeah, I I just I, that's very fascinating because they those guys had a very specific um, demographic they appealed to, and it uh, it was to people that were uh, like these like boys of a certain age. Yeah, yeah, that that's like John Claude Van Damme is like the action figure that nobody grows up to be, but that like every kid wanted to be growing up in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I'm gonna guess that Kim Jong Un, from from everything we know, probably felt the same way that y'all you did watching Universal Soldier. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all we all like art re- touches us all. Um, well, at, at, at it, eight years old, I think, because that movie came out, I think I was around yeah. around eight years old, my seven. And uh, I, I, well, I remember there was a cheap dollar theater, and I went. That's where I saw it. But I, what I, you know, specifically at that age, you're gonna think like. Yeah, guns don't get the job done. John Claude Van Damme does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You what? What are, what are guns gonna do? We, I've watched John Claude Van Damme like spin kick thirty people with machine guns to death. <laughs> like clearly, the guns don't do the trick. Yeah, uh, you gotta love that foreign policy advice. Now, uh, Kim Jong-un was at best a mediocre student. His real mother visited regularly to press him to focus more and study harder, but being the heir to a dictatorship, there weren't really any punishments for bad behavior at school. Jong-un's teachers obviously could not meet with his parents. Instead, that role was played by a rotating cast of random North Koreans who worked in the country's diplomatic corps. The justification given was that the boy's real parents did not speak German. As a foreigner who did not speak the local language, Kim Jong-un experienced middle school and high school as an outsider. For one thing, he wore nothing but tracksuits. Jeans were too American and forbidden for even him to wear. He was, however, allowed to wear the latest Air Jordans. Needless to say, he stood out visually, uh, as I think any kid wearing nothing but tracksuits and new Air Jordans would have in middle school. Um, this yeah. is so fascinating because I, I wonder to this day if he, because, you know, the, the basketball obsession obviously is still on, an ongoing thing. So I wonder if he's like a full on sneakerhead and if he has like, you know, a pair of whatever, like, like, uh, the, 
Travis Scott's new Jordans shipped to him or like I, I'm I, I would be shocked if he doesn't. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and that yeah. it, that blows my mind to no end because you don't uh, unless I'm missing something. I don't remember ever seeing him in popular media whenever he's you see him pictures of him on the news or anything. Oh, you no. You don't see him yeah. wearing these things. But I bet when he's walking Never. around the house, he is like looking at his closet and he's like, which pair of high top Jordans am I going to wear today? Yeah, he's got to have a shitload of Jordans. And I can't help but wonder, knowing that he wasn't allowed to wear jeans as a kid, if the secret to his madness might not be as simple as the fact that his mom wouldn't buy him Jinkos. Because <laughs> you know, that was everyone's cross to bear in a uh, in in, in yeah, middle school in the nineties was whether or not you could get Jinkos. Uh, so I sure did. I was able to get yeah. some. Oh yeah, I had a pair of Jinkos, absolutely. Um, but tragically, Kim Jong Un did not. <laughs> Now, uh, it's time for another ad pivot, and I was going to do a Jinko's ad, but, uh, but, but I, I don't know if the company still exists. So a lot of our ads are randomly slotted, and God willing, uh, when we drop to ad break, it'll be an ad for Jinko's. Fingers crossed but, uh, for Jinko's. You know, if it's dick pills, still pretty good. Still pretty good ad. Products! We're back. We're back. We're talking about Kim Jong Un in uh, middle school and high school in Switzerland, where he was at best a mediocre student, like the host of this podcast. And uh, I'm gonna guess and, most and of it's your, listeners. And your guest. And our guest. Yeah, yeah. A lot of C students in the entertainment industry. Yep. It's kind of kind of what fuels Hollywood. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Don't trust any A students in Hollywood. We just had a soundboard fall off of the wall. Yeah. Now, that, Eli, a I true need C I, student move. I need you to make sure is the poison room still intact? Yes. <laughs> okay. Are you are you aware of the poison room? Has anyone told you no, the, wait, that wait. room? Is that a real thing? Yeah, there's a poison room. You see that glass uh, balcony behind you that's walled off yes. from the outside? Yes. It's it's filled with poison because of the off gassing of the materials they use to seal it. So if that door opens, everyone dies. Amazing. Uh, it's still yeah, that's sealed. the poison room. It's still yeah, sealed. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for for now, it's sealed. Mm-hmm. For now. The door looks it's a little like off, a, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like a little bit of a sort of Damocles situation, where, where one day we will be struck down for our hubris of having the poison room. Um, I do like podcasting um, in a danger zone. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's what makes, I think, a podcast more captivating, and probably yeah. what, what's fueling us. Yeah, is the risk of pointless death. Yes. Um, yeah. He died now, doing what he loved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Being next to a room filled with poison. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, Kim Jong-un was a, yeah, not a great student. Um, and uh, as a foreigner who didn't speak the local language, he was, uh, uh, you know... He was kind of an outsider. Uh, he had two friends who were really like he actually hung out with a lot, and they were both kids who weren't Swiss originally too. Um, so they all kind of had that to bond over the fact that they didn't speak the language very well. Um, Kim Jong Un was particularly well known for his temper tantrums, particularly when his classmates would switch from speaking High German, which he knew, to Swiss German, which he could not understand. One girl who was a classmate of Kim Jong-un's reported, he kicked us in the shins and even spat at us uh, when they would start using Swiss German. And she did add that over time he seemed to thaw and get more used to dealing with his classmates as equals rather than as objects for him to abuse. Did any of them Um, ever fight back? I'm curious what the reaction was or what the students were, how they were told to react to it. Um, I, you know, they didn't know that he was the son of a dictator. I think they just thought that he was like, he probably would have just come across as like a mostly quiet kid who ha- every now and then would have temper tantrums and like spit on people. And I'm sure the teachers scolded him and stuff, but like, you know, it's not a, it's not like a, it's a, it's a Swiss, you know, school. So they're, they're, they're pretty light on the, uh, the discipline, the, the discipline. Yeah. They're not going to be like hitting him and stuff. It's not going to be like when I grew up in Oklahoma and they would paddle us. Yeah, because if you, um, uh, but also like if you spit on someone in school here, you, you're liable to get knocked the fuck out. Yeah, I don't think that's, yeah. I don't think that happened to Kim Jong Un. He might be a better person today if somebody had knocked him the fuck out for spitting <laughs> on him. But I have not run into any stories of that happening. 
And it seems like he was kind of isolated and a little bit lonely at school, but was not like bullied or or ostracized. It was more that like because he just didn't have a super good grasp at the language, he kind of felt like an outsider. Um, His chief love during this period continued to be basketball. He wore only the best for games. Michael Jordan replica Chicago Bulls jerseys, Chicago Bulls shorts, and of course, the latest Air Jordans. According to The Great Successor, Kim's competitive side came out on the basketball court. He could be aggressive and often indulged in trash talk. He was serious on the court, hardly ever laughing or even talking, just focusing on the game. When things went badly for him, he would curse or even pound his head against the wall. Sometimes, in addition to the other Asian teenagers Kim Jong-un arrived with, a couple of adults came along and set up small camping chairs beside the court, keeping score on a little board and clapping when Kim landed a basket. So... Again, he's as close to normal as you can have a childhood as a dictator during the periods of time where he's in Switzerland, but it's still not normal. Right, yeah, yeah, it's Um, still completely, oh my god. So, one of Kim's few friends at school noted that he also played basketball at home on his PlayStation when he couldn't be out on the court. Um, They said the whole world for him was just basketball all the time. Another of his friends, a kid named Marco Imhoff, spoke about the occasional hints he would see of the man Kim Jong-un would become. One time he came over to Jong-un's house for dinner, and their spaghetti was cold. Uh, He saw Kim Jong-un snap at the cook brutally enough that it stuck in Marco's mind 20 years later. Interviews with other classmates paint a picture of a quiet, nerdy, basketball-loving loner who absolutely avoided contact with girls and refused to share any details of his private life. One of his few good friends recalled, We weren't the dimmest kids in class, but neither were we the cleverest. We were always in the second tier. The teachers would see him struggling ashamedly and then move on. They left him in peace. He left without getting any exam results at all. He was much more interested in football and basketball than lessons. Wow. So, yeah. That's him at school. (laughs) Um, In 1998, when Jong-un was 14, his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She sought treatment in France and would linger for several years, but she eventually died from the disease. Her brother and sister, who had acted as Jong-un's fake Swiss parents for years, decided that their sister's sickness was a sign that they should flee for safety. Uh, On May 17th, they went on the run with their three biological children, abandoning Kim Jong-un and his brother, and showed up at the United States Embassy, asking for asylum. They live in the United States to this day. Kim Jong-un would spend his remaining time in Switzerland with a separate set of handlers, and we just don't know anything about how that impacted him emotionally. We don't really know anything about how he felt about his aunt and uncle. Um, We don't know how he felt about them fleeing for the United States. They, in the interviews with the author of uh, The Great Successor, they like reported being frustrated at the coverage of Kim Jong-un that they saw on TV in the States and how negative it always was. So they seem to still be kind of protective towards him. But we don't really know if he took this as an abandonment or if it was just kind of water off of a duck's back. Oh, man. I, I, I'm. This is what's most fascinating about it is his version is the most um, complex of of the succession. You know what I mean? Like his his other yeah. his his father and his um yeah. and his grandfather had much more like their stories are pretty, you know, like almost streamlined, whereas his has a lot of uh like complexities to it. And I'm sure I would wager to say that it 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 probably did affect him in the same way that he probably learned that he was the product of an affair. I I, I don't think yeah. those things at some point or another, they're gonna have some kind of impact on you. Yeah, it's just kind of hard to say what that is. Like, yeah. And that's part of why I'm concluding all of the Kims in two episodes as opposed to doing a, a two-parter on Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il is that like we just don't have that much really solid fact about how the two grew up. We yeah. know enough about Kim Jong-un that you can really make him into a person in your head. Right. Um, which you can't with the others. In 2002... Kim Jong-un returned to North Korea full-time to attend the Kim Il-sung Military Academy, where he learned how to manage the army that he had technically been a general of from the age of about seven. Official North Korean propaganda assures us that he was instantly so good at war that he wound up teaching his instructors rather than learning from them. He would regularly keep senior military officials up late into the night, advising them on how to organize their forces and shushing them whenever they told him he really ought to get some sleep. 
That's, of course, the official North Korean uh, Yeah, story. I was going to say yeah. this totally reeks of yeah. propaganda bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2008, Kim Jong-il's health took a major turn for the worse. He clearly realized that his time was ending and hurriedly rushed the process of making his son his official successor. That same year, he called a Workers' Party Congress and had them vote to confirm Kim Jong-un as his successor. This was the first time many North Koreans would have heard of the boy. In Jong-il's case, that process had started in the late 1970s, giving him 20 years as a public figure in North Korea before taking the baton from his father. Kim Jong-un would only have three years before taking power. What? Uh, no time. Sorry, just yeah. one question. What is the age difference when each of them get assumed in? Again, I... I, I I, oh, let's see here. Kim Jong Un was born in eighty uh, uh, four. No, those, yeah, yeah. He was born in eighty four, and Kim Il Sung or Kim uh, Kim Jong Il was born in uh, nineteen forty uh, or so, like forty forty one. Um, so he was born in forty one. He took you'd been like fifty three when he took power in his early fifties. Right. So he. Uh, I mean, clearly, obviously. Uh, he was the youngest, uh, Kim Jong Un. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Kim Jong Un is absolutely the youngest. But like, by well, a actually, fucking I mean, margin, like it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, he's a lot younger than his dad is when uh, when he takes power, which is you know largely because Kim Jong Il was an alcoholic uh, who poisoned his body and right. died very young. Um, which you know, if you're going to be a dictator, my preference is that you poison yourself to death. Sure, so, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, I'm down with that. Not going to complain. Um, with no time to waste, Kim Jong-il began promoting his son up the ladder like he was trying to win a sprinting award in the nepotism Olympics. The propaganda departments of North Korea began referring to Kim Jong-un as the leader comrade. The regime printed out booklets they sent to the army titled The Material in Teaching the Greatness of Respected Comrade General Kim Jong-un. It informed them that, at age three, Kim Jong-un had been capable of shooting out light bulbs from 100 yards away with a handgun. By the time he was eight, the book claimed, he could drive large trucks at 80 miles an hour. Shortly after publishing this, Kim Jong-un was promoted to command of the Korean People's Army, which was hereafter na- renamed the Kim Jong-un Armed Forces. So, wow. that's cool. Yeah, jeez. The the turnaround, uh, also I love that a, that a big flex for him is driving a huge truck at 80 miles an hour. Oh yeah, as a little kid? Yeah, yeah that is a big flex. Yeah. Now, the military that Kim Jong-un was about to inherit would be a fundamentally different force from the one that his grandfather had built and his father had inherited. This is because, on October 3rd, 2006, the regime detonated its first nuclear device. There is some debate still over whether or not it was a successful test of a low-yield nuke or an accidental fizzle that wound up being far smaller than intended. In either case, the detonation was an actual nuclear explosion, and North Korea would only get better at manufacturing weapons of mass destruction from that point on. Over the next five years, as Kim Jong-il sickened and began to die, Kim Jong-un increasingly took up the organs of power. The pride of being the first North Korean leader to develop nukes would go to his father, but Kim Jong-un would be the first of his line to learn how to use the weapons to get what he wanted. We'll talk about that and much more in part two. Eli, you want to plug your pluggables? Yes, please. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh... Check out Closure, the podcast that never ends, available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, I have another podcast called Pod is a Woman, uh, but I should say what Closure is about. Uh, I don't think Closure is real. And I interview a bunch of people. They tell different stories about whether or not they found Closure in certain things. And uh, it sounds weighty, but it's also great conversations. And then I co-host a podcast with Teresa Lee called Pod is a Woman, where we do a track-by-track breakdown of Ariana Grande's most recent albums. And we have a bunch of our friends come on and talk about whether they're into it or not. And, uh, of course, you can find me online on all the socials at Eli Olsberg um, and EliOlsberg.net for show information. And lastly, if you live in L.A., I have a show called uh, Performance Anxiety at the Pleasure Chest. It's a monthly stand-up show, uh, second Tuesday of every month. And I am Robert Evans. You can find me on the internet at IWriteOK on Twitter. You can find this podcast at BehindTheBastards.com. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at at BastardsPod. Uh, and you can buy T-shirts, uh, T Public Behind the Bastards. So check those out. Um, check it all out. Uh, if you listening right now are the child of a dictator, uh, who is going to school in a Western country, uh, hiding out under an assumed name and listening to podcasts as you bide your time until gaining power, uh, just remember, uh, I, I do take bribes. That's, that's all I have to say. Um, same. I, I would, yeah, I would, I would love to write a positive podcast about you and your family. So, uh, so hit me up. Um, we could, we could do a sponsorship, you know, 
Yeah, and Venmo me at Eli Olsberg if you yeah. uh, if you want to bribe me to talk about it. If you're gonna start getting like Gaddafi's kids sending you cash, yeah. <laughs> he's a big big fan of the show. Yep. Okay. Um, that's it. That's the episode. We're done here. Go go hug a cat or something.